And good morning, Third Church family. Our walk through the miracle series lands us today in Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 26. Let's go there now. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tomb. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot, kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demons into solitary places. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him and they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this to the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man whom the demons had gone out sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all of the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away, told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. May God add a blessing to the hearer, reader, and doer of his holy word. And I want to use for a subject in our time this morning, demon oppressed, demon oppressed. We are a country who boasts of our freedom. Land of the free, home of the brave. This year is the 247th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. 160 years of the Emancipation Proclamation. 104 years of women given the right to vote. And with all of these freedoms, we celebrate and enjoy a nation, but collectively and individually, we continue to suffer from bondage in a major way. While we may celebrate freedoms from physical, tangible oppressors, spiritually, we have become comfortable with being possessed, led, and influenced by demonic forces that desire nothing but to destroy us. This demonic possession comes in many forms. But you may be sitting there thinking, I'm not frothing at the mouth or speaking gibberish, but Satan is crafty. Here we are thinking everything is all right, but our behavior is destructive to ourselves and everyone around us. And for those of us who are saved, let me be clear about something this morning. We cannot be demon possessed. The Gospel of John affirms this in John 10 and 28. Hear these words. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So possession, demon possession is not possible, but demon oppression is very possible. Therefore, those who are saved can allow themselves to be demon oppressed. When we find ourselves not thirsting after the word of God, when Bible study doesn't seem to be very important, worship service is not that important, exercising our spiritual gifts in ministry is not that important, we leave ourselves vulnerable to demonic oppression. The enemy starts to deceive our minds, influence our actions and reactions to situation, and our resulting behavior is not synonymous with the character of one who has been saved one who is led by the Spirit of God. 
It seems so bizarre to me that this summer, many will spend thousands of dollars on fireworks and food and cookouts and on and on to declare a freedom when many are shackled, possessed, oppressed by a being far worse than any physical slave master. We are not very far removed from the Christmas season where we saw what was supposedly be a celebration of the spiritual freedom in the coming of Christ. But many celebrated by becoming financially enslaved by amassing toys and gifts that we couldn't afford and now trying to figure out how to pay for them while living less than check to check in their life in the name of Jesus. See, in a few months, we're gonna celebrate the 4th of July, Independence Day. And some of the most financially strapped people, the brokest people, they're going to buy the most fireworks, have the biggest barbecues. And let me get this straight. You don't have enough money for food, clothes. Kids' clothes are too small, ragged, bills are behind, cut off and collection notices coming like junk mail, no life insurance at all. But somehow we managed to get fireworks aplenty and enough meat to cook all day to celebrate what? An eviction notice? Our insatiable desires have caused many of us to be financially demon-possessed. John 8 and 36. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. If we've not called on Jesus to free us, we're not free at all. If and only if we have declared Jesus as Lord and Savior of our lives and now live for his will and not our own, are we spiritually free, physically free, financially free, and the list goes on. And if you've received this freedom in Christ, that's the freedom that's worthy of a celebration, worthy of presence, of fireworks, worthy of a cookout. In our account today, I wonder what it must have been like for this man named Legion. I imagine a young man growing up in the region of the Sea of Galilee, a fine young man, perhaps at one time a respectable citizen. Was he married? Did he have children? I wonder what circumstances led him to be running around naked, half naked at best if someone had pity on him and tried to dress him. As he roamed through the housing districts, people must have avoided him at all costs not daring to take a risk of maybe housing him for a night. So he lived out by the water in the tombs among the dead. For fear of their safety and perhaps for his own good, people had tried to chain the man up, putting shackles on his hands and wrists, but he just kept breaking them, displaying a superhuman strength. Mark's gospel tells us that he lived a miserable life out here in the mountains, separated from everyone by his madness and even hated himself. If you were to walk in those hills, you would have heard him crying out through the day and through the night. He would howl and cut himself with sharp stones from the caves. The Bible plainly tells us that this man was plagued by a mob of demons that went into this man named Legion. In the Roman armies, a legion of soldiers numbered about 5,000 men. We don't know if there were 5,000 demons present in this man or not, but there were many. These devils or demons, if you would, had been living in this man for quite a long time. I wanna take a look at this demon-possessed man today to discover together what it really means to be free. Satan and his evil followers are bent on destruction and every life they inhabit or oppress is chosen for that express purpose to destroy that life and keep it from being able to follow Christ. What do you think about freedom? What do you know about freedom? Have you come to a point in your life where you say, I am ready to be free? Are you tired of dead end, wrong directions, destruction of yourself and others around you? Are you ready this morning to be free? When Jesus walked into this man's life, he saw something in him that proved his readiness to be free from demonic spirits, something that cried out for deliverance and Jesus delivered him. So many people today 
who have never received Christ are possessed with evil spirits. And until they come to the place in their life where they choose to come to the one who can set them free, they will continue to be plagued by these demons of Satan. Freedom only comes when we choose to come to Christ for our freedom. Many say they are ready for freedom, but the statement is superficial because they're still too in love with darkness. Jesus said in John chapter three, verse 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. You see, if we are ready to be free, we, like the man at the pool of Bethesda, need to pick up our mat and walk and make no provision to return to that place. If and only if we're ready to be free, then our request for freedom cannot be qualified. Many say that they want to be free, but I still love to get drunk on a regular basis. Many say I want to be free, but I still want my actions to be dictated by this drug I love so much. Many say, I want to be free, but I, I need to play this last lottery number straight and boxed. Many say, I want to be free, but that buffet is calling my name and I have to answer, I'll wait and be free tomorrow. Many say that I want to be free, but what they did to me, I'll never get over it. And I'm going to hold on to this grudge, this hurt, this pain. Many say, I want to be free, but we say, all right. Go ahead and come over. This is the last time, for real, for real. This is going to be the last time. Some of us listening today remember the long-running sitcom, The Andy Griffith Show. In it, there was a town drunk, and his name was Otis. And despite several attempts to sober him up, he just wouldn't do it. And he had a jail cell reserved for him on seemingly a nightly basis where Otis would get drunk, then he would come to the jail, he would grab the key, let himself into the cell, lock the door, put the key back on the hook, and sleep it off. And I thought about that action as I wrote this sermon. Are we this morning like Otis? Just accepted sin as a way of life and Satan does not even have to try anymore with us. So we just go into the pain prison, the food prison, the drug prison, the sex prison. We get the key, get in the bed reserved for us, lock ourselves up, and hang the key back up. Something to think about this morning. Is my present reality imprisoned? Is my present reality imprisoned? Now, some may argue that this man called Legion had it made. He could do what he want, when he wanted it, where he wanted it, the way he wanted it. He had no one telling him what to do, what to wear, where to live, how to live, or anything else. He lived life with no restraints, something that so many people today claim that they want. But that's not a love of freedom. That's a love of self and a desire to be our own God. Church, there is no freedom in sin. One of the greatest obstacles to freedom most people will ever face is their own love of darkness they have chose to dwell. But if we are ever going to be free, truly free, the way we can be free is to step out of the darkness into the light of Christ. There was an occasion in Jesus's ministry where he was speaking to the Pharisees and he says to them this, if you continue in my word, then you are really my disciples and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And when the Pharisees heard what Jesus says, they started to get upset with him and said this, we are descendants of Abraham. We will never be in bondage to any man. And Jesus would go on to tell them that they were in fact in bondage and nothing they could do on their own would be able to set them free. 
And this is where many live in this country find themselves. We look at the Declaration of Independence. We look at the Emancipation Proclamation. And the same way the Pharisees looked at the fact that they were descendants of Abraham. And just like Jesus told them, he is speaking to us today. I don't care who your ancestors are what side of the tracks you grew up on or moved away from, there is not a march on Washington, a firework display, a cookout, a parade big enough to set us free from demonic possession or oppression. In Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church, he said this, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You could take the opposite of that statement and it will still be true. Where the spirit of the Lord is not, there is bondage. If we don't have the spirit of the Lord in our home, bondage. If we don't have the spirit of the Lord in our marriage, bondage. In our church, bondage. If we don't have the spirit of the Lord in us, we are in bondage. Jesus came to be the light of the world. And he says, my followers shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Church, we can find freedom like nothing we've ever experienced before. Mark this down. What you think you control will ultimately control you. We can't flirt around in the dark and expect to shine with the glory of God. So back to our account. And seeing Jesus, the leader of the two cried out and fell down before him in fear and said in a loud voice, what do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Here, the demons answer the question the disciples ask in verse 25. Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? He says, I beg you, do not torment me. It's interesting that time and time again, when the demons come face to face with Jesus on earth, they immediately knew who the son of the most high God was. They also knew of his sovereign power. They made their victims bow down thus acknowledging Jesus' deity and manifesting fear of his power. The Pharisees, on the other hand, and many of the people did not really understand who Jesus was, what he was doing, and why he had come to the earth at all. All systems of belief that have their beginning in the occult ask their victims to deny the deity of Jesus. Strange that many say they believe in God, but do not submit to God. They do not bow before God. They live their life like there is no God. James 2 and 19 says it like this. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. The demons were begging Jesus not to command them to depart to the abyss, the bottomless pit, hell itself. These demons had not been sent there yet like so many others before them. But they were well aware that once they experienced the final judgment of God, hell would become their eternal fate. For the time being, they were given a limited freedom to carry out Satan's wishes on earth by being allowed to house and express their evil spiritual nature in and through a human being. Now that habitation was being threatened by the Son of God. So rather than be cast out of man and sent to hell, they saw a herd of pigs feeding on the mountainside, and the demons begged Jesus to permit them to enter into the pigs. And he gave them that permission. And the demons came out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and were drowned. From Mark's account, about 2,000 pigs were killed. Jesus did not tell the demons to drown the pigs. Rather, he gave them permission to possess them. Once the demons went into the pigs, however, the animals panicked and drowned. See, the issue here was not the 2,000 dead pigs, but the redemption of the demonic man and the confirmation to the disciples that Jesus not only had power over nature, but over the evil one, 
and all of his demons. The death of the herd of pigs was a living demonstration of the death that would have eventually come to this possessed man had Jesus not healed him. Here's another point worth consideration. All of the town's conditioning, all their chains and shackles couldn't do for this man what Jesus had done with just the power of his spoken word. This should speak volumes to us about the counsel we seek from our demonic possession or oppression. Many seek ungodly counsel and find themselves no better off because the person they are receiving advice or counsel from is just as possessed or oppressed as they are. Many meaning well only give you more chains and more shackles with their advice. You ever talk to someone about your situation? And after the discussion, you feel unchanged, but more chained. Stop getting marital advice from people who aren't saved. I don't care if they've been married for 50 years. If they're not saved, then their witness is not credible. They may be able to tell you how to manage marriage, but they cannot tell you how to receive the fruit God intended from marriage. Don't make the person your life coach or mentor, and they just know one or two more Bible scriptures than you do. They may be able to tell you how to manage life, but they cannot tell you how to live life more abundantly according to God. Stop getting financial advice from people who still owe you money. And they're trying to figure out how to get from under a couple of payday loans themselves. That doesn't really need any explanation and we can move on. Receive from this account that the only thing that can free you is the word of God. So at this point in our account, there's good news, there's bad news. The herdsmen were in deep trouble because they were responsible to the owner for the well-being of this large herd of pigs. These men ran and told all the city, all the countryside, the good news that a man named Jesus had arrived on the beach, cast out the demons out of legions so that the people didn't have to fear him anymore. The bad news was that the demons ran into the herd of pigs, and before they knew it, the pigs ran off the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Wasn't their fault, they said, but the fault of the demons and this man named Jesus. The whole countryside then ran to the beach to see what had happened, and what did they find? They found legion and Jesus by the sea. And this former demonic sitting at Jesus's feet, calm, fully clothed, in his right mind, this healing had affected him physically, emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually. Instead of being dead in his sins and living in the tombs, he has been risen by the power of Christ into a newness of life. Instead of being naked, he's fully clothed. Instead of being violent, he was calm and joyful. Instead of being insane, now he sits in his right mind. Instead of being destructively possessed by Satan, he is now possessed by the son of the most high. And the people's response to this miraculous deliverance was Jesus, you got to leave. Now, let me get this straight. The people were not afraid of a naked demon possessed man breaking chains, but they were frightened when this man was healed, now sitting in his right mind. I mean, how odd that the people seem to be more at home with a demonic man than the Christ who cast out the demons. So what is our lesson here? Well, don't get discouraged, child of God, when you're asked to leave a social gathering or not invited there in the first place. Don't be discouraged when you are ostracized from a particular event. Look at what happened to Jesus. He came and brought healing and deliverance, but he was asked to leave. Everyone is not ready for light. Many times you don't even have to open up your mouth, but our mere presence shines a light on a situation and they cannot have that. So we are then asked to leave. When you, child of God, begin to show the light of Christ, darkness will not be happy. 
You will not receive certain invitations to parties or social phone calls will decrease. But don't be discouraged because Jesus told us, blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Write this down and really meditate on this. Popularity at the expense of integrity is demonic and is not of God. Popularity at the expense of integrity is demonic and it is not of God. I want to call your attention to something regarding the change in this man that is very significant, but we may have missed it. This man now has a sense of modesty or shame. Verse 27 says, for a long time, this man had not worn clothes. It is true that sin ultimately renders a person shameless. Modesty becomes a big joke. Yet at Christians, we are told to dress modestly with decency. Our heads are so turned by the visual that the Lord asked us to help one another. Let us be freed today from the demon of nakedness. When we get dressed, take a look at ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, am I trying to serve the head of my life or am I just trying to turn heads? Am I dressed to be Miss Right or just Miss Right now? God tries to tell us over and over, all who put this world first will be mastered by it. It doesn't take demon possession like with this man to see a person under the influence of evil and the evil one. According to the Bible, if God isn't controlling our life, then the things of Satan are. As a part of Satan's success is his subtlety. Satan is a master at directing lies from the shadows. And as long as we don't believe that Satan is there, we won't be alarmed and take action to change things. As long as we believe that there is nothing wrong with underwear on display or showing more flesh than fabric, then we are under the influence of the evil one. Is our self-esteem and self-worth so low that we feel we don't have anything else to offer but ourselves? So we display our nakedness to the world and we say, acknowledge me, accept me, please love me. And the world looks, acknowledges us, then rejects us, which leaves us even more devastated. But Jesus this morning is saying, I made you. Fearfully and wonderfully did I make you. You don't have to visually prostitute yourselves to a world that hates you. I love you and I want to build you up and break the chains that enslave you. The world never wanted you, does not deserve you, but I want you to come home where you belong. Jesus is saying, don't deny me. Don't ask me to leave. Notice the contrast between the crowd and this man. The crowd wanted Jesus to get out of town. Why? Hadn't they just been visited by the son of God? Hadn't they just witnessed the miracle of incredible power? Hadn't they just seen a man delivered from the bondage of demon possession? And yet they asked Jesus to go away. One of the saddest verses in the Bible is the last verse, verse 37. So he got in the boat and he left. Jesus didn't then and won't today force himself where he's not wanted. So he didn't beg. He didn't plead. He just left. You know, maybe the request had some connection with the pigs. Could it be that they were more focused on the possible loss of income from their property than the potential blessing that comes from God that was staring them directly in the face? You may say, well, that, that would be crazy, right? But don't people do the same thing today? People become so paralyzed by what they think they have lost. They just with their action tells Jesus to go. We need to stop being so concerned about what we may have lost and start focusing on how God has already blessed us, is blessing us, and will bless us. Jesus continues to give opportunities to accept him and to grow in him. Don't get your priorities so confused that we too send Jesus away. There was a man who was shipwrecked on a deserted island. 
and all of his possessions were lost at sea, and he barely made it to the island and survived. He stayed there for several months, and in order to have some sense of normalcy, he was able to construct a small hut out of wood and branches, and in the hut he put things that he had found to help him in his feeble existence. So one day, he was on the other side of the island looking for food, and there was a lightning strike. And his hut and all of the things that he had gathered for his life went up in flames. He was distraught. He shouted at God. He cursed God. Then one hour later, a helicopter followed by a boat had come to save him. He asked them, how did you know where I was? I've been trying and trying with all of my might for months to alert people of my existence. And they said it was the smoke from the fire that brought us here. Church. We need to bear witness to the fact that a fire in our life is not always a bad thing. We may be at a point right now where we have lost a lot, loved ones, house, car, job, our health. We are angry with God. We have cursed at God. We have said, God, why have you forsaken me like this? But my encouragement to you today is that it may seem like Lightning has struck your situation and everything seems to be going up in flames, but I'm here to tell you that help is on the way. The flames in your life are not going unnoticed. There are some things that need to be set on fire in your life. There are some things that need to be burned out of your life. And it makes no sense because these are things that have become an integral part of your existence. But we have to trust the wisdom of God that this fire that's burning out of control in your life right now has a purpose. Although this fire in your life right now, God has a plan. This fire in your life right now is not to destroy you, but it's burning so that you may be rescued. Help is on the way. You may feel your life is over since this person God burned out of your life, but help is on the way. You may feel like this job that is on fire is taking you out, but help is on the way. You may feel like your financial situation is going up in flames, but you your helicopter has spotted your distress and your help is on the way. You may feel like all that you love, all that you care, all that you have has about been destroyed. But my brothers and sisters, I tell you this morning, your help has showed up. Your help is here. Jesus says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says, I will give you rest. Jesus says, I love you. I died for you. I rose for you. And I'm coming back to really rescue you. It is not a time to send Jesus away but to say thank you, Jesus, for your purifying fire. Thank you, Jesus, for your cleansing fire. Thank you, Jesus, for your delivering fire. Don't send Jesus away today. He is here to make you free indeed. Have you allowed Jesus to free you this morning? I mean, really free you. From sinner to save, from living for the temporary to having an eternal purpose for your life. You may have been living in the tombs of this world without even knowing it, but the good news is this morning is you don't have to stay there. Today, Jesus is near. Will you do as this man did and come and kneel before him and be cleansed, or will you be like the crowd and send Jesus away? Does this thing called Christianity really make a difference? Interestingly, sometime later, when Jesus returned to this area, it says that a large crowd gathered to hear him. And they gathered because of Jesus. But I had to wonder if this crowd had gathered because of the deliverance of this man named Legion and his testimony about what Jesus had done for him that I am a living witness of what is possible when Jesus sets you free. Amen and bless God this morning. I want to thank you for tuning in today, and I pray that you have a great day of family, friends, and fellowship. I look to see you next week when we discuss Peter walking on the water. God bless you and God keep you today.